Good morning, everybody. How are you? Welcome to Breakaway Day 2. We're so glad that you're here. And it's my honor this morning to introduce our chapel speaker, uh, Pastor Kevin Landis, who's here with us again. And we're so glad he's here. He's a 2019 graduate of UVF. He also was a staff member for about three years here. And so serving in our admissions uh, department and Currently, right now, he has relocated or has been, been in New England for a while on staff at Crossword, Crossroads International Church, uh, where he has served as a next-gen uh, youth pastor. I know for some of you, he, he has been your youth pastor in the room, uh, but right now, currently in that role, he's serving as executive pastor at the church, and we're so glad he's here. Uh, would you join me in welcoming Pastor Kevin back to the forge this morning as he comes to share God's word? Well, good morning. I'm going to preach from my knees right now, I guess. Hold on one sec. Ooh, that's better. Good morning. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. I, I love being back at Valley Forge. It is home to me. And so I thank you. I want to thank uh, President Kim, a mentor of mine, um, valuable to my life, and, and the staff here also. You're you, I feel like we're family. That's all I can say. I just love being here because it's like I'm at home. Uh, so thank you for this opportunity. Um, this morning, what I want to share with you, uh, I hope that we will gain something on an individual level. Each person here gain something that will help us listen to God's voice. Listen to God's voice. Uh, there are four main ways that God likes to speak to us and to his people. Uh, the, one of them being through his people, through godly advice and through counsel. Uh, the other way that God speaks to us is in circumstances, just the way our life unfolds. Another is through prayer. And then also through his written word, the Bible. And that's what I want to emphasize today. That's what I want to highlight today. Uh, God's voice to us through his word. And I have a question. How do you relate to the Bible? Have you ever thought about that? How do you relate to your Bible? See, scripture is God's primary tool for speaking to us. It's his primary tool that he chose to convey himself to us, the main mode of of operation there. And so when we read scripture, we find that it helps us turn towards God and it helps us follow Christ and align ourselves with his way. One passage of scripture that has been heavy on my heart and just repeating in my mind comes from John 8. And Jesus, he stated this. He said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So the Bible, it does three things remarkably well. It reveals to us who God is, who we are, and how we can have a right relationship with him in Christ. Amen? And so what I've done today is I've brought a little illustration. Where is it? Right here. A mirror. I'm sure many of you visited one this morning. For those of you who didn't visit your mirror this morning, we can't tell. You look lovely. You look just great. Um, but I brought this little visual illustration for us today uh, to illustrate the Bible's role in our life. So here we have a mirror. And a mirror shows us how we look on the outside, right? Is my hair okay? Do I have something in my teeth? Uh, do I look presentable today? It doesn't hide our blemishes. Have you ever noticed that? The mirror does not hide our blemishes. And with a mirror, what we see is what we get. You look in it, and it tells you the reality. God's word is like a mirror in that way. See, while physically, a physical mirror, it reflects our physical appearance, the Bible acts as a spiritual mirror revealing what is on the inside of our hearts. And so we look inside God's word and we see our spiritual condition. And this mirror right here, maybe you have one that looks something like this. Maybe it's on your phone that you go to. Like a real mirror, it has no interest in hiding our blemishes. Have you ever noticed that when you're reading God's word? And so for, I want to look at an example of how God's word looks like a mirror in our life. We don't have to look any further than the Old Testament. So we're going to look at 2 Kings 22 today for our text. But I'd like to start 
by committing this time to the Lord with prayer. So would you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you for your presence in this place, that you are with us, Lord, that you never leave us nor forsake us. And Lord, I pray that as we look into your word, that it would reveal to us your heart, that it would go deep down inside of us and plant fruit, Lord, that would grow and flourish. Lord, help these words that I share not to be man's words, but to be uh, leading us towards your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me get a drink really quick. Get a little parched. Okay, so a little bit of passage context, Second Kings 22. So the nation of Israel, what we realize about the nation of Israel is that sometimes they followed God successfully, great, but other times they failed him miserably by turning to other gods. This was their pattern. And First and Second Kings, they tell us a story of a long line of kings and rulers that came after King David. And we learn which of Israel's rulers were righteous and which were unrighteous. So in, in the first and second Kings, you see this criteria that the author, when he introduces a new king, he kind of gives us a summary of how they did. I, I read that and I wonder to myself, uh, if, if a summary statement were written of my life, would it say that Kevin did good In the sight of God, he did what was right and pleasing to the Lord, or would it say Kevin did what was evil in the sight of God? It's a challenging thing to see. Um, You'll see there's criteria that that the book of 1 and 2 Kings has for the the kings. I won't read them to you, but they'll be up on the screen maybe. Um, But essentially it's this. Did the king successfully lead Israel to worship the one true God, or did the king lead them astray to, to worship false gods. That was kind of the, the benchmark. How, how did these kings do? And I'm curious what you think. How many kings passed this test? Not many. Only eight out of 40 kings met the criteria. The majority of Israel's kings did evil in the sight of God. And the evil kings, they caused the nation to sin. And these evil kings, they promoted the worship of false gods all except for a few eight. And so with Israel in this backslidden state, that's where we look to 2 Kings 22. And 2 Kings 22, it's an instance in the Old Testament where God's word acts like a mirror for Israel, and it showed them the blemish of how far that they had fallen from grace, how far they had drifted from God. So in this context, we meet one young king named Josiah. It says this, 2 Kings 22, 1 through 2. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he reigned for 31 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jedidah, the daughter of Adiah of Bozketh. He did what was right in the sight of God and walked entirely in the ways of his father David and did not turn aside to the right or to the left. That's a good summary statement there for someone's life. And as a, personally, as a youth pastor, I really like King Josiah because he was passionate about God from an early age. He was passionate about God from when he was young. Second Chronicles, actually, 34 says this. It says, in the eighth year of his reign, he, when he was still a youth, so he's about 16 years old, it says that he began to seek the God of his father, David. So then by age 20, Josiah's zeal, what it does is it leads him to a project to restore God's temple. He's zealous for the Lord. He wants to see God worshiped properly. And so he starts this building project. And while rebuilding the temple, something amazing happens. Josiah's men, they find a long lost copy of the law, of God's word. See, the written word, the written law had been destroyed up to that point. The evil kings wanted nothing to do with it, and they they worked tirelessly to destroy God's word. Yet, in God's providence, a little remnant remained in some closet in the temple somewhere, and this was uncovered. So God's chosen people, they, they don't know God's word at this point. Thus, they've backslidden and all that. And the lost book that was discovered in this chapter is considered to be either the Torah, uh, scholars think it was the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, or at very least, it was Deuteronomy, which conveyed God's standard for righteousness, God's standard for right living. 
And so 2 Kings 22, it continues. It says this in verse 8. Then Hilkiah the priest said to Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, who read it. Moreover, Shaphan the scribe informed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest has given me a book. And Shaphan read it in the presence of the king. When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his clothes. That's quite a response. He tore his clothes. Now, I want to pause just for a second, and I need a breakaway. I need some help from a young man, a breakaway. I need a volunteer, okay? Because when I read something like that, he tore his clothes. Uh, my, imagine, just, my imagination just takes over, and I, I start to imagine what that might have looked like. So I need a guy, a young man, to help me with this. Raise your hand. Throw me your, right here. I see you. You're being called out, okay? So here's what we're going to do. All right, come here. So, so what's your name? Uh, Landon. 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 Nice to meet you. I'm Kevin. Uh, Landon, I need your help to visualize this. He tore his robes. There's a picture I probably have up there too. But I want you to put this on. You can keep that then by the end of it, okay? Can, can we give a, a hand to Landon? He's going to put this shirt on. Oh, so there's that. Yeah, okay. Right there. All right, Landon. You feeling good? You got to rip it off. You got to do it. Okay, this is why you're up here. Okay, so we're going to count down from five, and you're going to rip that shirt. So ready? F count down from five. Five, four, three, two, one. He tore his robes. There he goes. Let's get it. There's... Now, Landon, you can keep that vest of yours. Thank you. I just needed to see that visually, okay? Thank you, Landon. Give it up to Landon. That was good. Thank you, Landon. I appreciate that. He tore his robes. Why respond so dramatically? Why would King Josiah hear God's word and respond so dramatically? This seems almost like an overreaction, doesn't it? Maybe an epic overreaction. But actually, in, in that day, tearing your clothes, it properly expressed utter shame and shock. So what Josiah was doing by tearing his clothes was he was bringing himself low in humility. He needed to display his humility. He was embarrassed. He was humbled before God. And that was his expression. He tore his clothes. See, previously, Josiah had probably been familiar with, with God's word. Maybe had heard a few scriptures here and there just from memory's sake, oral tradition. And so he probably knew some of it, but certainly he never heard God's word in its entirety. And so then this lost book is found. It is read before him. And suddenly, King Josiah is exposed to God's word. Just to give us some context for what King Josiah might have been reading, we have a few passages from Deuteronomy that I've selected. So Deuteronomy 6, it says this. This is maybe some of the things that he heard as God's word was read to him. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give to you today to be on your hearts. Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Or Deuteronomy 8, it says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way into, through the wilderness these 40 years. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I am giving you to this, this day. Or maybe Deuteronomy 18, it says, When you enter the land of, of the Lord your God, the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. So King Josiah is hearing these things. He's starting to see God's standard, the, God, the standard that God set for his people. And Josiah is seeing how far that they have missed the mark. So Josiah turns to his men and he gave this reason for humbling himself, this reason for why he tore his clothes. It says this in verse 12. Then the king commanded, Go, inquire of the Lord for me, and for the, and for the people of Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For the wrath of the Lord that... Excuse me. For the wrath of the Lord that burns against us is great, because our fathers did not listen to the words of this book to act in accordance with everything that is written regarding us. Josiah realizes that God's anger is burning against Israel for their sins because they had turned to other gods. 
their Lord is displeased. So the men, what do they do next? They go and they investigate the book of the law further. And just a side note, I'd like to point out that it's, it's very helpful and useful in our lives to have people to come alongside of us to help us understand God's word. Okay, if you're having a hard time looking into God's word and saying, well, what does this even mean for me? I encourage you find somebody who can come alongside you with wisdom and walk you through that. It's so great. It's so important and valuable to have those kind of guides in our life. But what the what the men did there in this story is they go to a a prophetess, uh, a prophetess of God, a woman named Huldah. And she told them the consequences for Israel's wickedness. Verse 16, it says this. This is what the Lord says. Behold, I am going to bring disaster on this place and its inhabitants. All the words of the book, excuse me, all the words of the book which the king of Judah has read, since they have abandoned me and have burned incense to all their other gods, so that they may provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. My wrath burns against this place, and it shall not be quenched. Coming destruction. Are you starting to see the cause of Josiah's humility, Josiah's agony? He saw the nation's sin and all its blemishes, and he tore his clothes, all because he looked into the mirror of God's word. All because he looked into the mirror of God's word. Now, for a fun social experiment, uh, I'm not going to have anybody rip any shirts. I'm just giving you a visual. Uh, anyway, for a fun, here's, here's something you can go take away and do, maybe even right after we leave this room. Go to a public place, okay, and watch what people do when they see their own reflection, okay? Maybe, maybe you're one of those people who might do this, but when I was a student here, you guys have probably walked by, you know, Cardone Hall and the library and everything. You'll see the floor-to-ceiling mir- uh, windows, right? They're, they're like mirrors you're walking by. And what was the, so fun when I was a student, when I would be on the inside, right? People can't quite see through because it's reflecting back at them. So I'm just standing there, and people walk by. They're going to class or whatever, and all of a sudden, their, their whole posture changes. Their whole demeanor changes. Have you noticed this? Am I the only one? Maybe if you go to the mall, somebody walks by a... a, a a mirror or something like that. People just like, something happens where all of a sudden they like get really cool with their walk. And they start putting some strut into things and they're like uh, checking themselves out. Hey, you look good today, you know? Come on, you guys haven't done that? All right, tell me if you know somebody who does that. Raise your hand. Come on. You see yourself in the mirror and you start like, okay, you got it together. I hear you. Well, there's a social experiment for you. I know you've done it. You've checked yourself out. How cool do I look? And I'll be honest, that's probably not a healthy reaction, a healthy relationship to have with a mirror. So maybe we can shape that up. But I have a question to reflect on then. We're talking about God's word as a mirror in our life. What do you do when you see your reflection in God's word? What do you do when you see your reflection in God's word? See, King Josiah, he tore his clothes. He was humbled. How do you respond to the mirror? Remember, the Bible, it only reveals the stark truth. It only reveals what's on the inside of our heart, our spiritual condition. So here's a few ways that we might respond to the mirror that I've seen, maybe even in my own life. See, we may prefer the mirror just to show us the things that that we like to see, our best qualities. We may go to God's Word and, and just associate with all the heroes and be like, yeah, that's me. That could be our relationship with it. Or we may keep away from the mirror. We may just like throw this in a closet, put it away, because we, we, avo- we want to avoid seeing maybe our flaws. I've seen some people who, they don't really like the stance that God's Word takes on some hot-button issues, and so they reject it and depart from it entirely. I've seen people with that response to the mirror. Or maybe we may accept what the mirror shows us and humbly ask, well, what must I straighten up today? What must change in who I am today? What is our response to the mirror of God's word? One friend of mine uh, it reminded me of this quote. I was talking about this subject with him, and he reminded me of this quote. I don't know who it's by, but it goes like this. When you read God's word, God's word reads you. 
Have you ever noticed that happening? When you read God's word, God's word reads you. And it's a really pithy saying. I'm sure it's a good, like, tweetable quote. Um, But anyone who genuinely reads God's word has found it to be true. As I read my Bible, I begin to see things about myself that need to change. Am I the only one? No, here's why. I want to point something out. Here's why that is. Ever wonder, why is it that I just like, sometimes this makes me uncomfortable reading God's word. It shows me things I need to change about myself. Here's why. Because seeing good, viewing good, exposes bad. Say that again. Seeing good exposes bad. So God's preferred method to reveal himself to us is through scripture. That's his preferred primary first method to reveal himself to us. And when we behold God's holiness in his word, when we see his statutes, his righteousness, his holiness is right in front of us, it exposes our blemishes in contrast. I have some advice for you when you open God's word, when you read God's word. Some advice when you sit down with your Bible. When you look into the mirror of Scripture, don't necessarily expect for it to show you what you'd like to see, but always anticipate that it will reveal what you need to see. Because when we read Scripture, God Himself speaks to us personally, He knows your needs. The Lord becomes your personal teacher when you sit and open and read his word. Imagine that. God himself teaching you and teaching me. Well, that level of intimacy is exactly what happens. Second Timothy says this in chapter 3. It says, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, God wants you to have an intimate relationship with him. He wants to have an intimate relationship with you. And it's not only here around an altar or during music, but more regularly when you sit with him in your armchair, when you have your cup of coffee, when you open his pages and he begins to speak to you through his word, that level of intimacy. The psalmist experienced that personal relationship with God through his word. And he wrote this, Psalm 119, it says, I'm just jumping through a few of these passages, but it says, oh, how I love your law. I meditate on it all day long. Your commands are always with me. I meditate on your statutes. I obey your precepts. I have kept my feet from every evil path so that I might obey your word. I have not departed from your laws for you yourself have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. That is a good relationship with God's word. Really a good relationship with him through his word. So King Josiah, back to our our main text, King Josiah, he needed to see the state of his nation as God saw it. What scripture showed him, that sight humbled him. And tearing his clothes, it was really probably an underreaction, the state of his nation. And the prophetess Hulda, it told the nation's demise, like what God was going to do in destroying Israel. But she also had a word for the king. And this is the encouragement that I want us to take away. Let's look at the prophetess's encouragement to King Josiah. Here's what that encouragement says. But to the king of Judah... Who sent you to inquire of the Lord, this is what you shall say to him. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says regarding the words which you have heard. Since your heart was tender and humble, and you humbled yourself before the Lord, when you heard what I spoke against this place and against its inhabitants, that they would become an object of horror and a curse, you have torn your clothes and wept before me. I have indeed heard you, declares the Lord. Therefore, behold, I am going to gather you to your fathers, and you will be gathered to your grave in peace, and your eyes will not look at all the devastation that I am going to bring to this place. So they brought the word back to the king. 
See, Josiah responded to God's word with repentance. He was repentant when the mirror showed him his reflection. His humble response, it actually spared him from the coming, the coming devastation. It was a healthy response to the mirror. We're talking today about our posture before the Lord. Knowing who we are, a right perspective of who we are, knowing who He is, beholding His holiness, and entering into the relationship that He offers to us. Josiah realigned his kingdom with God's word, and he gained an intimate re with relationship with God through the scriptures. And here's what it says in 2 Kings 23. This is what it tells us about Josiah's reign. Moreover, Josiah removed the mediums, the spiritists, the household idols, the idols, and all the abominations that were seen in the land of Judah and in Jerusalem, so that he might fulfill the words of the law, the law, which were written in the book of Hilkiah the priest had found in the house of the Lord. Before him there is no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart, all his soul, and all his might, in conformity to what? The law of Moses, God's word, nor did anyone like him arise after. This summary of Josiah's life reminds me a lot of Jesus' commandment to us. When he said, it says Jesus of Jesus, he answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. I have a question for you. It's a funny question, I guess. It has to do with the mirror. Can you blame the mirror when you wake up in the morning with bedhead? No. No, you've got messy hair. It's not the mirror's fault, okay? The mirror only shows you the situation. It only shows you what's going on. But after you see the problem there, right, what? Your bedhead can meet Mr. Comb, and you can do something about it. See, the life of King Josiah, it tells me that I can actually be grateful when Scripture reveals my unsightly condition, I can actually be grateful when I look in here and I say, wow, I've missed the mark a little bit. Why can I be grateful for that? Because it allows me to realign myself by the power of the Holy Spirit with God, turning towards Him. It allows me to come back into right relationship with God when I submit myself to His statutes and His law and His word. I want to read that passage again as, as a musician comes up. Jesus stated it. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's what I want. That freedom is something I'm interested in. Before we can take a step towards our futures, I'm sure many of you are here at Breakaway, you're, you're here studying at UVF, and you're wondering, like, what's going on for my future? What does God have for me? Listen, before you can take any step in that direction, before you can really see what God wants to unfold in the plans and the purposes of your life, you must step towards Jesus. You must step towards God's ways. And I believe that God wants to use his word today to help us turn to him right now, this morning. And so I wonder if you would do something maybe a little awkward, a little unconventional with me. But representative, we have like a little visual here of this mirror. While looking into this mirror, can we all just take a moment of silence and looking into this mirror for a brief second and invite the Holy Spirit to speak to us, just as we would when we open the pages of God's Word.
looking into that mirror. It's just a, just a mirror, just an object. But as we look to God's word, my prayer for you is that you would find God's voice leading, guiding, directing your path, and maybe even sometimes correcting us. You know, it's kind of unfun sometimes when I feel like I'm always talking about like how we fall short, because that's really the, the nature of things. We have a sin nature, we fall short, and that can be really discouraging for people. Some people might hear that and they might even be like, I don't want any of that. You're just all about how, how awful we are. But there's another reality to this truth in scripture that I think people leave the room before they see it, okay? Because this passage, uh, one passage that I believe the mirror God's word wants to reveal to us today is 1 John 1, 9. And it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So looking into the mirror of God's word, it may be uncomfortable and it may be unsightly in the beginning, but after a while, what happens is we look in again and we start to see that Jesus eclipses our reflection. And I brought a little activity just because I want this to stick, okay? So again, a little visual helps us remember things. So we look into the mirror, right? It shows us maybe some unsightly things that we don't like to see. But after a while, we start to look into God's word again and we start to see a new truth that God wants to speak to us. And instead of seeing our disgusting reflection, we start to see Christ in the place of who we once were. That he wants to replace that rottenness. He wants to replace our mistakes. He wants to replace our wrongdoing. And he wants to cover over that with his blood so that when God looks down and sees us, he doesn't see our mess, but instead he sees Christ's reflection. What God wants to do when he speaks to us through his word is he wants to conform us to the image of Christ so that no longer are we seeing just all, our, all of our shortcomings, which is the truth, is the fact, but instead we see the glory of Jesus who interposes himself over us and we become more like him. Before long, we begin to recognize God's transforming work through his scriptures. My encouragement to you today is to learn how to study God's word, learn how to interact with God's word among your peers, learn how to to hear God's voice from the primary method that he chose to deliver his voice to us. He's showing us who we are in Christ and how he is making us more like Jesus every day. Can I pray for you today? Lord, I thank you for my friends and I thank you for the moment in their life that they're at, Lord, because I know that you see their whole story, you see their whole picture. But Lord, your voice, your, the inspiration of your Holy Spirit can come into their lives wherever they are even right now. And so Lord, I thank you for this space, this time at Breakaway, and I pray for your blessing and your anointing over these, your people. And I pray, God, that you would speak to them, that they would have ears to hear, Lord God, and that when you speak, you would reaffirm who they are in Christ, who you're calling them to be, and they would live it out boldly. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Kevin. What an important word that we heard this morning. Uh, break warriors, we just want to remind you there are a couple things left on your schedule. You can check your lanyards, but we'd love for you to check out Heritage Hallway as we have some info tables for you to, to be there. You also can apply, as uh, Charity told us at the beginning of the service. Students, you're dismissed. Break warriors, you're dismissed. Have a great weekend. Have a great day. As the spirit was moving over the water, spirit come over us, yeah. Come rest on us, come rest on us. As the spirit was moving over the water, spirit.
baby, come on.